going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It's Henry Zamota, Danny Abdeljavar, and on today's show, we have a guest. Uh, we have Christian Sorensen. Uh, Christian is an Air Force veteran, a military analyst, an independent journalist, mainly focused on war profit. Uh, he's the author of the recently published book, Understanding the War Industry, which uh, we're going to talk about today. And uh, Christian is a a senior fellow at the Eisenhower Media Network, the EMN, an organization of uh, independent veteran uh, military and national security experts. And that is the group, uh, that is um, Danny Sherson's group. Um, Danny is a, um, is a friend of the show. He's been on the show about, um, I think, four times. And mm-hmm. we met Danny. We had the, the privilege of meeting him in person last year. Uh, he's a great guy. Um, Christian, uh, I would love to hear a little bit more about EMN. Like, how did all this start? Like, how did you all link up together? And, and, and what are you trying to do over there? That's a great question. First of all, thank you, gentlemen, for having me. This is a real, uh, this is a real treat on my end. EMN, the Eisenhower Media Network, came about under uh, Danny Sherson's leadership. He's um, really sort of paved the way and coalesced sort of the progressive and the even some libertarian and across the political spectrum, veterans who are trying to insist or make space for those among the overall military and intelligence veteran uh, community that are pretty much tired of the wars. And we're tired of the wars for a variety of reasons, which we can obviously get into. And um, especially today, it's, it's very critically important that we collectively push back against what seems to be the standard traditional quote-unquote patriotic sentiment that uh, you know support the troops but support the troops is then leveraged into supporting the wars and we try to draw a line there and basically say look if you actually support the troops then you support ending the wars because the wars are harming the troops the troops end up coming home either dead or maimed physically or mentally and so we're just trying to sort of create a little space there and um, with uh, no matter who's in the White House we want to sort of stand by our principles and say no more wars no more war profiteering and uh, you know let's take a stand so um, the the MIC um, so the the MIC has has I think kind of become a a catch-all phrase for um, kind of spooky, nefarious forces that incentivize um, government, meaning politicians, to uh, you know vote for increased military spending and um, engage in constant warfare. And I think a, a big problem is is that a lot of people have a very difficult time articulating uh, you know what the MIC actually is. Like what what does the MIC do? And I think that's where you know you you really come in with uh, with understanding the war industry. It, it gives a a really it gives you a really good understanding of what are the different parts of of the military industrial complex, what it actually does, how they um, you know go about um, profiteering on on various conflicts across the world. So I, I would love to kind of ask you a pretty broad question, and and I want to use the language that you use in your book. Um, you know, what is the, how would you explain the military industrial congressional triangle to, I guess, someone who doesn't know or, or do that much research on, on this topic? Outstanding question. So the MIC, the military industrial congressional complex is, it's a triangle. It's a triangle of authority. The military side is not the average soldier, sailor, airman, or marine. It's not the E-4 grunt. It's not even the low-ranking officers. The military side of the triangle is largely the Pentagon, the decision-making headquarters for the U.S. Armed Forces. The industrial side is the impetus. It is the propellant. It consists of the corporations, what I call war corporations, that develop, market, and sell goods and services to the Pentagon, to the overall U.S. military establishment, and to allies, whether they're governments or regimes around the world. 
And then the third side is just Capitol Hill, Congress, the Senate and the House, which fund the whole racket. They fund the U.S. military establishment, which then turns around and purchases from the U.S. war industry. And Congress's other job is to pass favorable legislation, not favorable necessarily to the health or the well-being of the troops or the United States as a whole, but to war and to the perpetuation of war. And we can get into the various ways that industry sort of uh, pressures the military or pressures uh, Congress and acts sort of as the propellant to the whole thing. But that's the overall military, industrial, congressional triangle. That's a that's an incredibly um, well put uh, statement there. And I think you do an awesome job um, breaking down the, the, as Henry put it, the anatomy of the war industry. Um, a couple of the ones that we picked up on, you know, lobbying firms, pressure groups, PE firms, corporate press, even Hollywood, think tanks. Can you maybe go through each uh, of these or a few of these and kind of um, explain their role in uh, this triangle? Sure. So let's take... Um... Let's sort of take a step back real quick and analyze or set forth just the, just real quickly the ways that the war industry um, can leverage influence within the Pentagon. So the war industry pushes and it pulls. It pushes by locating its civilian, its um, corporate executives within the civilian offices within the Pentagon. So you'll have the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy or the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment. And those heads, those chiefs of those civilian offices come invariably from industry. And the most famous example is the most recent guy, uh, Secretary of Defense or Secretary of War, as I put it, and as it once was called, you had Mark Esper, mm -hmm. who just got the can, but he came from Raytheon. Right. And one of his predecessors, uh, Mattis, came from General Dynamics. So you right. see this again and again. So it leverages influence that way. And then it pulls by keeping an eye on what generals and admirals are about to retire. Who's, who's, who's uh, you know, going to join the civilian ranks soon? And then they pull them into war corporations. And they can have any job there, uh, usually one of the senior executive jobs, a VP, uh, sometimes they're lobbyists and the real good networkers, the real good schmoozers become uh, directors on the boards of directors. Mm -hmm. And no matter what position they take, their knowledge is then flipped. It's leveraged into corporate profit. So I just mentioned this real quickly because that's the background we need sure. to understand sort of the overall thing. So you have that to begin with. You have think tanks, which you mentioned. Um, the think tank's job is to put out information favorable to its donors. That's, that's it. That is the, uh, that's sort of the basics there. Now, this happens for any, corp any type of corporation, any type of industry. One of the more famous ones could be the fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. If you are a fossil fuel corporation, you donate to a think tank. That think tank is guaranteed not to put out any real honest assessment about your pollution, sure. your criminal activities, anything like that. Makes so sense. that's sort of, yeah, that's sort of the, the think tank thing. Excuse me. So when you have, when we're talking about the war industry in particular, and the war industry funds every major think tank in Washington, D.C., the think tank's job then is to variously hype up any number of threats, real or perceived to the United States. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, you then have increased uh, bloated Pentagon budgets because the Pentagon then uses that giant budget to purchase goods from the war corporations that are then funding the think tank. So the goal there is to basically craft the narrative. And uh, yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty nefarious stuff. And what you see now and what you see every four years is when presidential candidates are forming their uh, prospective cabinets. 
the think tanks swarm. Mm -hmm. So you're not getting good people. You're not getting principled people, um, whether you're on the Republican team or whether you're on the Democratic team, red team or blue team. The think tanks swarm. You get vets, vested interests. You get people who are part of the overall blob, whether they're war profiteers or they're unscrupulous uh, academics. They sort of uh, they dive into the foreign policy teams. So that's sort of the major major role of think tanks. They um, they basically invent the pretext for war. They promote fear and they hype the the current list of uh, of bad guys. So uh, Michelle Flournoy, who is uh, I guess in the running <laughs> of the uh, Secretary of Defense under under Joe Biden, uh, does she kind of serve as an example of kind of like a holding place? Because like the think tanks, they also serve as um, kind of a revolving door for people who are not in government to get paid money and then be selected uh, yeah. whenever I guess that time is convenient. Like, is she a good example of that? She's an excellent example. I'm really glad you brought her up. Uh, I want to point anyone who's listening right now to the independent journalist, Kevin Gastola. He runs a website called Shadowproof, but he recently wrote a comp, uh, column for uh, The Gray Zone, which is Mac Blumen Max Blumenthal's um, website. And uh, the column basically uh, highlighted how the bulk of Biden's foreign policy team and quote unquote defense team comes from the overall military industrial congressional complex. And mm -hmm. Flournoy is really an example of the, uh, the worst of the worst when it comes to the revolving door. Now you mentioned the revolving door just to quickly define it. It's basically the track around and around the MIC. You could maybe be uh, one of the undersecretaries or assistant undersecretaries or deputy assistant undersecretaries of war, then you rotate into mm, the, you know, uh, C-suite of a war corporation, or as you noted, uh, maybe you go and work as a think tank. Flournoy founded one of the think tanks. I think she's one of the original founders of the Center for New American Security, which is one of the mainstream, quote unquote, uh, liberal think tanks where you get the liberal hawks. Another one of those think tanks is New America Foundation. And, um, then she rotated around to uh, variously Bose Allen Hamilton Board of Directors. She was also with Boston Consulting Group, which, um, you know, I spend a good chunk of my day looking at military contracts. And Boston Consulting Group really wasn't in the military contracts as of a few years ago until Flournoy got there and their contracts with the Pentagon really skyrocketed. So it's, it's corrupt and you will not get um, uh, peace. You will not even get peace as an option with these type of characters um, in these cabinets. Because not only do they have no skin in the actual game down, sea, down range or overseas, but they have plenty of skin in the game when it comes to profiteering. So let me, let me, let me get this straight um, for you know, those who are following here. We've got... On the one hand, you know, the military side, we've got a number of generals or, you know, uh, commanding officers, things like that, that are exiting the military. Uh, and um, you pointed this out in your book that there's literally no shortage of them, that there are more. Um, uh, I believe the quote that you had on there was that there's more uh, uh, generals right now, four and five star generals than there were in, since like World War Two. Or Correct. something ridiculous, yeah. uh, which I find crazy. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, that's interesting. Um, so they have no no uh, shortage of of you know people to recruit from uh, mm -hmm. the war industry that is, and then the war industry themselves will also give money to you know these think tanks and these think tanks will you know help form public opinion, uh, but also definitely sway uh, a lot of the you know uh, congressional candidates things like that the legislative portion of this you know um, the the political portion of this triangle, um, mm -hmm. and then. Um, Basically, we're getting the industry part of it to ratchet up interest in war so that they could, you know, sell serve goods and services, weapons primarily, um, but also logistics and things like that to the mm -hmm. military. And they're also kind of playing the Congress so that we can sign the checks for it. I mean, I hate to be, you know, <laughs> I hate to be, you know, facetious here, but it sounds like a circle jerk to me. <laughs> it is it really is and 
it's um, I always say that it's insulated, like it's an insulated triangle. Right. Um, because it really is. You know, we don't, as, as um, citizens or, or residents, we don't have uh, direct control over the military. We don't have, obviously, con direct control over industry. You know, corporations are increasingly um, opaque and um, devious. But we mm -hmm. should, in theory, have uh, direct control over our Congress. And mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, due to, as you noted, industry's actions, we we whatever we think we have, whatever democracy we think we are owed is null and void because as soon as they, as soon as a congressperson steps foot on Capitol Hill, they're swarmed by lobbyists and the war industry has the best lobbyists. As soon as, before they even step foot on Capitol Hill, they're corrupted by campaign finance. You know, the war industry will typically fund both the red team and the blue team and then whoever gets in the office owes the war industry. The war industry has captured them. And then, um, yeah, we can get into the way that they spread jobs or quote unquote jobs mm -hmm. across um, congressional districts in order to, you know, pin down the congressperson before they uh, before they even meet the lobbyists, before they even touch the campaign finance. So it's uh, the key is that industry has uh, all of the not only power, but sort of the corporate authority and they run the show and so yeah as you said it is a uh it is pretty much uh you know uh an uh isolated and rather insulated uh circle jerk <laughs> very much so um and i think you brought it up so let's let's go there um i think what would be interesting to hear from you about is uh you know your your thoughts or, or some insight as to how you know, jobs play a role in, um, you know, this this circle jerk. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to keep calling it a circle jerk until I have a better word for right. it. <laughs> how, how do how do defense contractors spread the production of of weaponry across different congressional districts, and and why do they do it? Like, why is it spread out that way? Because you see, guys being affected politicians let's just say uh, a lot of progressives look at bernie sanders as someone who's anti-war but he was in favor of the f-35 mm -hmm. why do why do people why is this uh set up that way yeah so it, it's interesting that you brought up sanders because you know i'm not one for um conspiracy theories but uh one of the f-35 i believe it was the guard or reserve squadron was located in uh in this town of uh in burlington mm -hmm. and um so that's one way to get it it's also important to note that general dynamics which is probably the most um, diverse war corporation when it comes to different um, business sectors of war it has so many different uh, uh, types of goods and services that it puts out uh, it basically makes everything except for fighter aircraft one of the general dynamics uh, ordnance divisions uh, munitions divisions is located in Williston, Vermont, which is also just outside of um, Burlington. So we, you know, we think of Vermont as sort of a, um, a progressive or even a libertarian, maybe a you know "don't tread on me" type of uh, paradise. But uh, the uh, jobs card is played there as well. So the the general gist of it is there's no accountability. They the war corporation, and you can do, you can go on any corporate website and see their press releases. You know, Lockheed Martin is going to add 400 jobs at Fort Worth. Um, you know, Northrop Grumman is going to add 300 jobs in Sunnyvale, California, et cetera, et cetera. The war corporation makes a big deal about being a jobs creator, quote unquote. Now, there's no accountability. They don't have to come through with any of that job, any of those job numbers. But uh, since you, you know, we'll go back to sort of the insulated triangle, Congress just wants to be able to cite these job numbers. Mm -hmm. Now, the U.S. working class is so beat up and so uh, abused by neoliberal economic policies. That is to say, the uh, automation and outsourcing of jobs and uh, recourse to the market for everything, the gig economy, that they're, they're happy to just get a few. And so it's basically the war industry saying, hey, jobs, 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 and then Congress saying, yeah, jobs, jobs, jobs. But um, 
they, they don't have to actually come through with any of those jobs. The war industry has a variety of ways to um, inflate the jobs totals. So they'll, for example, include uh, induced jobs in their totals many mm -hmm. times. And induced jobs are not jobs that the war industry is actually bringing. You know, it's not uh, include. You know, it's not uh, the person who's putting the tire on the armored vehicle or something like that. Induced jobs are jobs that the war industry says, "Hey, you know, since we have located this facility in your town, you need two more waitresses at the local diner. You need mm -hmm. the <laughs> uh, ride-sharing app guy who right. is driving people around, driving the corporate executive from the pub to the gym or whatever. They include those. So it's absolutely, it's absolutely absurd." And um, it's really frustrating. It's really, it's really unfortunate. And um, there was, I, I cited in the book, I don't remember the source off the top of my head, but an independent um, advocacy group tracked, excuse me, Lockheed Martin's corporate earnings. That is uh, to say what they received from the uh, Department of War over X amount of years, and it was like four or five years. And during that time, Lockheed Martin was the single biggest corporate recipient, or excuse, yes, the single biggest corporate recipient of federal dollars across the entire US government. And at the same time, it was decreasing the number of jobs it actually provided to the US working class across the board. It decreased by, I think, 14,000 or something like that. And so at the same time, it also, was using in its publications and is in its uh, releases to Congress and in its lobbying uh, the jobs card. It was saying, "Hey, we are a we are a great jobs provider." So there's no connection between reality and um, and what a corporation says. You know, the corporations are masters of the public relations game. And I just want to conclude this little part by saying that the Political Economy Research Institute at uh, I think it's UMass Amherst has come across, uh, has come out with a study, I think it came out in 2017, that basically said the following. A dollar, a federal dollar, invested in education or infrastructure or uh, clean energy produces more jobs than a federal dollar going toward war or quote-unquote defense or preparation for war. And that's what we have to sort of keep in mind here is anytime they play the jobs card, we must, regardless of where you stand on the political spectrum, you must come back and say, look, if you actually cared about jobs, you'd be investing uh, the bulk of your discretionary funds in uh, non-militant uh, aims. Anywhere else. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> well, 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 let's go back to the F-35 because the F-35, um, as many of our listeners know, it's something that we've we've talked about quite a few times on the show, and you know, we highlight that it is the most expensive military project ever. It's what I believe one point five trillion dollars uh, is the estimated cost right now. Um, how does a fighter? And just to go back, the justification for this is like, well, it's going to create jobs, like. Well, we got to sell. We can't stop selling weapons to Saudi Arabia because we have two groups of Muslims that hate each other. So we need to we need to keep on selling because we need to create more jobs. That was like the justification uh, for like our relationship with Saudi Arabia for a while. But F thirty, the F thirty five is the most expensive plane, and it falls out of the sky. How <laughs> how does a project like this happen? Like how, like what are the forces behind that create such a disaster? <clears throat> Yeah. So you mentioned that it falls out of sky. It does. And it has many other problems. Uh, the Pentagon came out with a, a report, public report, within the past two months. And it said that there are roughly, if memory serves me correctly, um, 800 uh, significant problems with the F-35. And wow. it then went on to say that the uh, U.S. military and the primary contractor, which is Lockheed Martin, have no intention of remedying about a hundred of them. So even if they get it up to up to snuff, quote unquote, they're not going. It's not going to be you know a good thing. And uh, it's as it currently stands, it can't fly when there are certain rain clouds around because it can't fly in lightning. So if you if a war pops off and you need the F-35, you better hope that there's no you know 
uh, cumulonimbus clouds around because you, you're not going to take off. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely absurd. Hold so, on. Is it, isn't it called the F-35 lightning? No. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Exactly. Which is the, you know, complete, oh, you ironic. couldn't write this stuff. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, and they, they say in, in um, development and like software development, um, those hundred things that they're not going to fix, those are actually features, not bugs. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> no, and we can we can even get into that because there's there's a uh, case that I make in the in the book regarding obsolescence and regarding uh, sort of the uh, deliberate uh, intricacy of some of these weapons platforms. You know, the more intricate you make it, the more lines of code you make it, the more um, interconnected you make it, the more vulnerable it is, and then the more upgrades and the more um, you know, uh, modifications and technological insertions you get to then sell. So we must always remember that war corporations are just like any other corporation. They do anything and everything they can to maximize profit. And so that's sort of the root of the of the whole endless war thing. But to answer your question, the F-35. Back in the day, if you were a war corporation, let's say around mm, the Vietnam War, you were required to have a fully functional prototype before the Department of Defense or the Department of War would sign a huge contract to acquire that weapon. Mm -hmm. Now, with sort of the corporate, the corporate takeover of all things war and the Beltway's insistence on corporate primacy in, at every step of the way, the Pentagon does not require a war corporation to have a fully functional uh, proven prototype before agreeing to purchase a ton of them. And that's just, it's absolutely absurd. So war corporations, I mean, I just, I have to pause there because that's just, uh, <laughs> it goes against even the most basic, um, you know, contracting uh, principles in, in any other aspect of the federal government, this would be a scandal after a scandal after scandal. But with the F-35, it's, it's just sort of, you know, a walk in the park. I want to, um, also emphasize that the F-35, any aircraft, any drone, any submarine, any aircraft carrier, these are all platforms. Industry sees these as platforms. You and I see an aircraft, you and I see an aircraft carrier, you and I just see a sub. Industry sees these as platforms. So the F-35, yes, it is a Lockheed Martin product, but many other corporations sell goods and services to go on the F-35. So mm. there are tons of corporations in addition to Lockheed Martin that are also pressuring government, that are also bringing all of their resources to bear to keep this program going. So you'll have uh, with the F-35, uh, for example, Raytheon's Pratt & Whitney brand makes the engines. Right. You'll have General Dynamics um, selling IT support. You'll have a variety of corporations selling maintenance overseas. Um, Boeing will sell, will sell some of the um, training systems, the air crew and the maintenance trainers, and on and on and on. So that's another thing that we have to keep in mind. There, there's, so, there's so many interested corporate parties involved that um, it's almost too big to fail. And then um, lastly, just sort of to wrap up this question, the way the F-35 is too big to fail highlights sort of an overall problem that I touch upon in the book um, inherent to the contracting process. So war corporations use a variety of what I basically call schemes. So the, the first step is during the early contracting process, they'll say, all right, it's only going to cost X dollars. And then inevitably and invariably, the cost grows and the cost grows and the cost grows. So you, under, you underestimate the cost and you overestimate the performance. And this is exactly what we saw. Mm -hmm. in the F mm -hmm. You know, it's, they, it's marketed as being um, a fifth generation stealth fighter. And, you know, it can't shoot straight. As you mentioned, it falls out of the sky. There's nothing stealthy about it. Actually, <laughs> another problem is it can only carry, um, I think, four large uh, missiles or bombs within its weapons bay. Right. Now, if you're going into battle, you probably want a little, a little more than that. You want but a few more than four, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So your other option is to put, uh, like they do with the F-16 and the F-15 and the F-18, put them on the wings, on the pylons under the wings. Right. But that would then reduce any remaining stealth characteristic that the aircraft is supposed to have. 
Right. So, you know, it was barely a stealth aircraft before this, and now, you know, it's not a stealth aircraft if you actually want to win a battle. So there's that. So then uh, one of the other schemes is uh, you structure the contract to regularly include um, upgrades, hardware, software, anything. They sell all sorts of, and we can get into that later if you want, just the absurd amount of billable categories that the war industry mm-hmm. um, sells to, to the Pentagon. Um, another scheme is pushing for non-competitive contracts. So, you know, in, in theory, if two corporations or three or four are competing, then the price goes down. But, um, if it's non-competitive, if it's a no bid contract, then, um, you know, the taxpayer gets screwed and then, um, yeah, so I'll just, I'll leave it at that. There are other ways that they, you know, get some trickery into the contracting process, but that's just, it's, uh, it's very frustrating no matter where you are in the political spectrum. So something I, I learned uh, from your book is, and I always I always had this question, h- how do they um, drive up those prices of, of goods and services? Like how do they, um, um, how do they get these non-competitive uh, b- b- biddings? And it's through FAR subpart 6.3, uh, 6.302. That's yeah. what they cite. Uh, I believe it is. You'll do a better job explaining what it is, but can you explain like exactly what the process is of um, and how they achieve a non-competitive bid? Sure. So just we got to step back first and just remember that the lawyers and the legal team that corporations can bring to bear and the resources and the funding and the expertise that they can bring to bear and the contracting officials that corporations have, many of whom used to work within the Pentagon and now are working for profit for the war corporation, far better than anything that the Pentagon, you know, throws at the war industry. So the, we got to remember that the, the corporation is really in the driver's seat throughout the contracting process. Now, the federal government, whether you're in, you know, commerce, labor, housing and urban development, defense, whatever, has this rule book, basically called the Federal Acquisition Regulation, the FAR, F-A-R. It's basically a rule book book that sets out the parameters by which the U.S. government can push purchase goods and services from any industry. The Pentagon abides by the FAR as well. Now, in practice, what happens is the war industry seizes upon uh, a certain part of the FAR in order to keep contracts non-competitive. And like we talked about before, non-competitive contracting drives up the price of the good or service because when you have multiple corporations competing, it invariably brings down the price just a little bit. So there are, and stop me if this gets too uh, uh, obscure or too um, you know, esoteric. But We love this stuff. So there are basically um, seven parts of FAR 6302. FAR 6302 is sort of the subsection that delineates non-competitive bidding. So dash one is basically says you can have, you don't have to have full and open competition when the contractor is quote, the sole responsible source that is able to satisfy agency requirements. Now that is a very, very broad category. And you see this one uh, when when I look through the contracting announcements uh, every day, you see this one thrown around left and right. It's basically like, you know, if you're in trouble and you need a non-competitive uh, contract and, or, you know, the, the project is behind and you need a non-competitive contract, you throw out FAR 6302-1 because you can at any point basically justify, well, you know, General Dynamics, it's a General Dynamics good or service. So, of course, general that quote-unquote contractor is the sole responsible source that is able to satisfy, you know, agency <laughs> requirements. It's um, yeah, it's no good. And then, do you have uh, a do you have a specific example of that dash one um, that we can use just to kind of like wrap our head around it, or yeah. or maybe just like a hypothetical could work too. No, I don't remember the date, but um, there was one within I'd say within the past year. Uh, there are many, but the one that I'm thinking of happened within the past year. Uh, General Dynamics. Uh, so let's back up real quickly. Uh, the war industry's think tanks and media affiliates have basically created. Uh, what is known as great power competition. It is the Cold War 2.0. And it says basically, 
There's no cooperation with Moscow or Beijing. They are our enemies. We must do everything we can to uh, not only contain them, but to maintain all sorts of military superiority across the board, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So having great power competition, you can then justify the purchase, the expansion of um, the war budget, and then the subsequent purchase of a variety of goods and services from the U.S. war industry. Now, we had, since 2001, we had the quote-unquote war on terror, and that served its purpose very well in terms of war profiteering. These war corporations got fantastically rich. Wall Street got fantastically rich, and um, corporate executives got fantastically rich as the U.S. working class was sent off to fight and die in the rich man's war. Now, mm -hmm. what happened is, after a while, the war industry began to realize and you see this reflected not only in their press releases and their earnings calls, but you see it reflected in um, when they're interviewed at arms fairs and et cetera, et cetera. They began to realize that if you want to sell the real big ticket items, you know, cyber warfare, uh, nuclear, a new generation of nuclear weaponry, submarines, aircraft carriers, it's very hard to pitch those goods and services when you're fighting what amounts to glorified gangs on the four corners of the earth. Mm -hmm. And so they need, they need a major industrial uh, nation in order to compete against. That's sort mm -hmm. of, that's the real key here. The boogeyman. So, exactly. You need, mm -hmm. you need the boogeyman. You need a so, boogeyman that can, uh, you can point to and say, hey, we need our nuclear weapons because they have nuclear weapons. We need our aircraft carrier because they have one. We need hypersonic weapons because China made one hypersonic <laughs> cast off of its coast. And now we need to throw three billion, you know, every few months at it. So in any event, just to answer your question, yeah, General Dynamics um, received a whopping new um, contract for its uh, new Columbia uh, submarines using FAR uh, 6302-1 as the um, sole responsible source that is able to satisfy agency requirements. And in that case, uh, so there, there are a few, maybe two major shipbuilders, General Dynamics and Huntington Ingalls, but that, that is simply because the U.S. government has allowed mergers and acquisitions within the U.S. war industry um, like wildfire over the past you know, couple decades. So you could have more um, you know, providers of goods and services no matter what the business sector of war is, if you had not allowed all of these monsters to gobble up one another. And um, so, yeah, so that General Dynamics submarine contract is a, is a pretty good example of 6302-1 in action. Yeah, you, you pointed out uh, actually in your book, and I think this your book was released when last year, right? Uh, that there was some... Summer. Yeah, so there were some like active acquisitions or mergers happening even while you were you know getting ready to... To yeah. release your book, I think it was L3 and who else? Uh, so L3 was merged? merged with Harris. Harris, Harris right. Mm -hmm. And we recently had a huge merger between Raytheon and United Technologies, and it's now mm -hmm. called Raytheon Technologies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so uh, I, I kind of want to hang on on something that you mentioned before, and, and just ask kind of an like a dumb question for someone as as well studied as you. Don't we want the best weaponry and technology to maintain like an edge? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I have no problem if there were actual threats out there, but what I see again and again is no attempt to use diplomacy first, no mm -hmm. attempt to try any other option on the international scene aside from bullying and uh, basically military power. Mm -hmm. And then I see the threats being hyped, you know, you, you have during the so-called uh, war on terror, which is continuing at a, um, a pace during the great power competition, you had glorified gangs that really did not pose any existential threat whatsoever to the United States and no coherent strategy from the Pentagon. The war industry was in the lead. And that's when you get uh, our young um, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines, our brothers and sisters, our mothers and fathers, our sons and daughters, sent off to fight, you know, Boko Haram in Niger and Nigeria and, you know, at, uh, you know Al-Shabaab in Somalia. These groups pose no threat whatsoever to the United States. There is no strategic interest whatsoever in being there, aside from 
the fact that war is profit, aside from the fact that we have one of our only industries remaining in the United States worth a damn, as George Carlin pointed out, is the uh, U.S. war industry. So I have no problem saying, hey, you know, we should have the best gear um, to face the threats if there were threats. And if we had the best gear, we have this bloated, by some counts, over $1 trillion every year thrown towards war and preparation for war. And as we pointed out with the F-35, and we can go down the list, there are many other, you know, really, really crappy products out there. We don't even have the best. So it's, um, you know, the, the argument uh, that you that you made, and I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah, it just doesn't, you know, doesn't hold any water. Yeah, it uh, sounds like there's, there's more of an, an incentive to make the most expensive military equipment rather than the best military equipment. Well said, well said. I wonder, um, you know, and I, I won't bore everyone on this. Not every time, not every day I get uh, someone from the Air Force to nerd out about planes <laughs> on. Um, but real quick before we move on from this point, um, Sequoias or F-22s? Oh, that's a great question. You know, oh man, that's a great question. I, I really appreciate uh, just from... So my specialty is contracting and looking at the contracts and looking mm -hmm. at the profiteering. I actually appreciate the F-22 just from a contracting perspective because what I saw was, while it did cost an arm and a leg, it cost a ton of money, and the Pentagon ended up not being able to buy all it originally wanted to buy because of the just absurd price of these aircraft. Right. But what I appreciate is that it showed up in the contracts for a given period of time, and then you really haven't seen it since. There was one contract, or maybe two, over the past fiscal year for maintenance, and it was a, it was a, they were pretty big contracts. But it wasn't what you see with the F-35, where it's still in what's known as low-rate initial production, mm -hmm. which is basically we don't have a viable aircraft yet, and it's still, you know, getting all sorts of contracts for There's all. There's ten sorts more of squadrons. <laughs> exactly, exactly, and it still yeah. stinks. And so I appreciate the F-22 just from a, um, from a contracting perspective. And all indications are that it is functioning at least somewhat as marketed um, out there. Uh, you know, one of the downsides is the enormous price tag. And they, didn't, they weren't able to buy even, I think, half of what they uh, originally wanted to buy. But, um, yeah, but the Sukhoi is, is, uh, is incredible. And you have to hand it to... Um, both Moscow and Beijing when it comes to um, designing and redesigning those types of aircraft because they are, um, by all indications, and I'm no specialist on uh, Russian planes and Chinese planes, but they seem to have a better record when it comes to maintenance than our aircraft. Our aircraft, uh, because of the profit incentive and because of you know, all the upgrades and et cetera, et cetera, they seem to always have you know, more maintenance and not enough parts and et cetera, et cetera. But um, it seems, uh, at least from my cursory glance, that uh, the maintenance record overseas uh, in Sequoia is, um, is fairly stellar. So, I, I really think that that's an awesome perspective that I rarely go down. I mean, myself, you know, outsider looking in, I'm just looking at how cool are they? Are they, do they yeah. perform, you know, can, you know, how many G's can they pull? How much armaments <laughs> can they carry? You know, yeah. how fast do they fly? Things like that. Uh, and by all by all of those measures, F F twenty two is a is a stellar plane in my book, and I have the same problem trying to find out like the newest Sequoias versus the F twenty twos, who's going to win in a dogfight, right? Right. Um, but I'm not really thinking about you know the economics of them, and you know you're you're absolutely right to point out that the F twenty two is really expensive, like <laughs> extremely expensive, and Russia spends a minuscule fraction of their of their already much much smaller military budget developing these planes yeah. and they're almost as good in yeah. my opinion oh, absolutely so it's it's almost like you know someone you know we built a ferrari that's got a ferrari price tag and somebody else you know souped up a you know a tuner car <laughs> and it, it's matching the performance for a fraction of the of the you know price and yeah we got a dope plane or car in this analogy sure. but they can you know, if they put enough money behind it, they can buy twice as many of them. Exactly, exactly. And big ups to them, you know, if you uh, if you take, uh, not to say that Russia and China don't have their own war industries, but if mm -hmm. you take a lot of the profit-making uh, incentive and just the rapacious profiteering out of it, you can have a functioning um, 
you know, milit- quote unquote, military industrial complex. And I want to also just point out that it wasn't always this way in the United States. Prior to World War II, we stood down, you know, we're a very uh, uh, belligerent nation. We have been involved in wars for most of our, you know, 200 some odd year history. But we, um, we would stand down after the wars. We would you know, sort of um, uh, get rid of the standing army and we would sort of, all right, you know, let's calm down. And the difference is after World War II, we kept the standing army and we kept the war industry and we expanded the war industry. Before World War II, we had what was known as the arsenal system, where basically government-run arsenals were where all of the ammo and the weaponry were made. And with the uh, signing of the 1947 National Security Act, it basically you know, put the icing on the cake and we have had uh, yeah, the military industrial congressional triangle running amok ever since then, and peace has been nowhere in sight. I mean, it, it's hard to argue with that. <laughs> it's, it's hard <laughs> to make any any kind of like rational um, excuses for why we have that. And I mean, maybe we can come back to the jobs thing because honestly, I think what, what you cool. write in the book is 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 true. You know, it's all about the money. It's about the the money. That's the reason why we still have a standing army because we and by we i mean the corporations can sell to them right and mm. they can sell them goods and services and then those goods and services are going to create quote jobs even if those jobs are as you point out uh, earlier induced like the mm. waitress in the town where they're building mm. you know the submarines um but uh there's also the services and i we didn't really touch on this and i'd love to um tell me about boss so the base operation sports services you know specifically it, I was pretty shocked to find out that almost every job um, is done by some private corporation instead of the servicemen or men. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, should we be trying to, like, quote unquote, repatriate those jobs for those servicemen and women? So great question. So from an industry perspective, you want to take over most of what were once inherently governmental jobs. You want to take over, for example, base operations sports services, which you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Base operations sports services is, is um, industry nomenclature that basically means we are going to uh, take care of everything on the base, keep the base up and running. Right. And sometimes security is involved, but usually it's um, you know cleaning, uh, mowing the lawn, uh, snow plow, mm-hmm. light mm-hmm. maintenance on sort of the, you know, maybe the fence or, uh, you know, paving, that type of thing. Anything that just mm-hmm. keeps it running smoothly. But from an industry perspective, you also want um, several hundred thousand soldier, sailor, airman, and marine to stay in uniform. Uh, not just because you as industry are the one getting paid to put out all of the recruitment and retention advertisements, which we can get into if you want, but okay. also because you need people to uh, minimally staff um, the warships. You need people to minimally staff the, the base. You need people to minimally you know, fly the drones, although drones can also be uh, flown by corporate contractors, as we've seen in contracting in recent years. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, there's a balance there. You want to take over as many government, inherently governmental jobs as possible jobs that used to be done by the troops, but you don't want uh, no troops left because you still need some to um, to carry out uh, a few of the, uh, basically run the platforms that you are also selling. So you mentioned boss. That's just one of the many profitable business sectors of war. So you have boss, you have propaganda, you have public relations, recruitment and retention, all done by corporations. So we, you know, um, military recruiters get a bad rap and in many cases they should because oftentimes they lie to you know the youth of the United States and promise the moon and then you don't get the moon and um, it's very uh, very troubling but mm-hmm. we must remember that corporations are the ones putting out any ad you see on TV any ad you see for the military on social media any banner ad these are all done by corporations which before I started analyzing contracts, I had no idea. And before I went into it, you know, when I was in the military, I still didn't even know. You know, that's something that I had to learn, uh, you know, through my own uh, research when I got out. So there are many other, and I'll just quickly name a few other profitable, uh, profitable business sectors of war because it's important to know sort of how broad 
the war industry is. Uh, training and simulation, they sell that. They sell machine learning, intelligence, ordnance, all the bombs, all the missiles, all the hypersonics, mm -hmm. um, space, the entire U.S., almost the entire U.S. space infrastructure, infrastructure mm -hmm. space force, anything, uh, space and missiles uh, center in um, El Segundo, California. It's almost entirely corporate. The satellites are made by corporations, particularly the big four, um, Boeing, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, and um, Lockheed Martin. Um, all the ground-based monitoring of satellites, all the launch vehicles, anything that shoots, um, you know, brings a satellite into space, all corporate, um, running the ranges, uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, and um, Cape Canaveral, and um, what is it, Patterson, uh, not Patterson, uh, Patrick Air Force Base on the east coast of Florida. And, you know, it's just the entire space uh, business sector war is corporate. And um, nuclear weaponry, uh, information technology. Information technology is the, uh, by my count, the most profitable business sector of war because, you, know, you know, they sell cyber, they sell anything that, um, you know, anytime you log onto a computer, they sell software, endless upgrades. Um, well, it's great. Software is awesome because there's no hardware involved, right? Well, sometimes there could be, but mostly, you know, you just sell a license to something that you already built indefinitely with no mark. Like your margins are incredible exactly. in software. Exactly. And and one of the things that we always see is um, sort of the um, the uh, boomerang effect. So you'll have uh, the U.S. military being obviously the first to use nuclear weapons. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we did that. And then, um, you know, Russia developed uh, nuclear weapons. We developed land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles. Russia developed land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles. So then the war industry said, all right, so we got to defend against this. You know, we built that, now we got to defend against it. Let's sell defenses. So then you sell anti-ballistic missile systems. You see this now, and I brought this mm -hmm. up, you see this now with cyber and IT. The U.S., again, was the first to use the U.S. government I want to be specific, not the U.S. public, the U.S. government used uh, cyber weapons uh, in conjunction with the Israelis uh, to attack uh, Iran. It was, I believe it was called Operation Olympic Games, and uh, it was the Stuxnet virus. Mm -hmm. Used it to cripple the um, Iranian centrifuges. And so then, after that, as cyber weapons proliferated, the U.S. war industry then said, all right, well, we got to sell some cyber defenses. And so you just see this again and again and again. You sell the offense, then once that weapon becomes uh, widespread, then you sell the defenses. You see with drones, you know, the U.S., uh, well, the U.S. and the Israelis were the ones to first really weaponize drones. Um, you saw the U.S. really get going in the Balkans in the 90s with their drone program. And then uh, after 9-11, obviously, we've been drone striking everywhere from Pakistan and Afghanistan to Somalia to Yemen. And um, we have drones flying over Libya. Um, Western Africa as well. Uh, there were drones reported to be used uh, in the southern Philippines. Um, so it's just, uh, and then you see the militarized drones in the U.S. border. And then you now are selling, the U.S. war industry is selling uh, counter UAS, counter unmanned aerial systems technology, basically ways to either hack into or variously disable drones, shooting stuff at it or um, you know, jamming it. So Sticking a hawk on it? You ever yeah, see those? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so it's um it's uh, there's always room for for more profit and uh, i guess that's the uh the summary of this little so i guess my follow-up and this again sorry for the dumb question but no, no, I love if 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 the private corporations are doing all these jobs and they're making all the things mm -hmm. you know there was this one interesting example about how you know, the U.S., uh, in your book, the, you said that the U.S. Navy isn't running Pearl Harbor, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of wild, right? Yeah. So the dumb question here is, if the Navy isn't running Pearl Harbor, or broadly speaking, if the U.S. you know military in general isn't running the U.S. military, what are they doing? That's such a great question. So <laughs> one of the things that I see uh, increasingly, one of, the, one of the trends I see in recent years with uh, the contracts that I look at is increasing contracts with consulting firms. Mm -hmm. And I ask myself, every time I see one of these, if you need to hire, if the Pentagon needs to hire consulting firms in order to make decisions, then what 
in the blue hell are the generals and admirals doing? Your job as a general and admiral is to make a decision. Make decisions, right. You don't need to hire these consulting firms. And these consulting firms, Deloitte, um, Boston Consulting Group, mm-hmm. you see, uh, and we can get into the audit because there are a lot McKenzie, of McKenzie, yeah. Mm-hmm. McKenzie, absolutely. Mm-hmm. You just see them just getting boatloads of money to make decisions that should be made by the U.S. military uniformed personnel. And so there's really no excuse. There's really no excuse. The only answer that I can give to you is that we have so thoroughly corporatized the gears of war that that they only know recourse to corporations. And remember, those who are in the uh, positions of authority across the military industrial congressional complex come largely from or are influenced largely by the war corporations. And um, yeah, it's just sort of a, there was a great piece back in 2010 by William Arkin and uh, Dana Priest for the Washington Post called Top Secret America. And there was a phrase in there called self-licking ice cream cone. And that's basically <laughs> what the, yeah. the military industrial congressional complex is. It generates the problems, it generates the excuses, then it you know, pitches goods and services and it solves, solves a problem using, it's just, it is one big um, self-licking ice cream cone. Definitely. It sounds like a racket. Bingo. <laughs> um, I want to if, if ahead, it's with you, Henry. I, I want to see like so. You, you've done an awesome job, Christian, of of really giving us like a ten thousand you know feet high overview of like what's going on with the military industrial complex. And for the next couple of minutes, I'd I'd really love to spend some time just taking a look at what are the implications, you know, for like contemporary examples for things like right now, you know. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, uh, where. I think we're, we're, we're just past an election season, so it's been crazy. How, how do you think, you know, the war industry has influenced or infiltrated, uh, you know, the, the press, the corporate press? So we have to um, just to begin with say that the best anyone can expect from corporate media is infotainment. It is not news. It is not pure information. Because the business model, and I don't care whatever you tune into, whether it's CNN, Fox, MSNBC, whatever it is, the business model across corporate media is to attract the most viewers or in many cases, in many cases, the most clicks possible. It is not to inform. So they're after the advertising revenue. You mm-hmm. want to, because you justify as a corporate ent- as a corporate media entity, you, dro- you justify your, um, you say, hey, look, we have you know, this big of an audience, and then you get more uh, advertising revenue, the bigger your audience is. And that's the business model. So that's the baseline. Then the next best thing you can accept, or you can expect from corporate media is for them to convey the opinions of the ruling class. So the corporate media reflect corporations. And corporations are about profit. You are never going to get anything that dissents from the ruling class. You'll never hear about, um, you'll never get a deeply pro working class sentiment. You'll never hear about how powerful the people are when they unite across racial lines. You will never hear uh, an honest class history or history of the US working class within the United States, anything like that. So, and actually to add to that, there are about six corporations that own most of the media within the United States. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's business interests that are running the whole show. And so that's just the baseline that the MIC is working with. So it's, it's favorable territory if you are the war industry and you're looking to you know, influence this. It's already primed for you. So the MIC then enters the arena. You have war industry taking out advertisements on corporate media to further confine the debate. So you'll have, for example, if you tune into, you know, Chuck Todd or any of these, uh, you know, Sunday morning news programs, you will see inevitably a war corporation or two on the commercials. And you, you ask yourself, why is, why is General Dynamics taking out a commercial? It's because General Dynamics doesn't produce you know, a damn thing that the U.S. public can use. Yeah, I can't buy anything from them, right? (laughs) Exactly, exactly. You're not buying a sub. You know, you're not buying 
Maybe no. one day. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe. You're not buying, you know, uh, artillery or anything like that, you know. So it's um, it's designed to further confine the debate because in uh, most cases, the pundits are not allowed to speak ill of the advertisers. And so it's basically, you know, making sure that uh, they stay in line. You're never going to get if, you know, if Raytheon or Lockheed Martin or Boeing or Northrop Grumman or General Dynamics takes out an ad on your Sunday morning talk show. You know, you are not going to then go into a 10 part investigative series on why uh, on war profiteering. You're simply not. I mean, that's just and you're not going to get to the root causes of the endless wars. Can't we just sick the uh, cancel culture on them and just like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> hashtag cancel Lockheed, hashtag cancel Raytheon. Can't we just do that? Right. Wouldn't that be fantastic? I would just, uh, man, I would be I would be uh, very, very excited if that happened. And so then you have. Um, then the MIC sort of uh, six its goons um, to be national security experts, quote unquote, on corporate media. So you have uh, career revolving door douchebags who then go into corporate media. You'll have John Brennan, who was director of CIA under Obama, showing up on MSNBC as a national security pundit. You'll have Mike Morrell, who was uh, he was acting director of CIA, but I think he. Uh, the, he was deputy director of CIA for a long time. You know, you'll have generals like uh, Jack Keane who shows up on Fox News. So they have all the bases covered. And so whenever a matter of war or the occasional matter of peace comes up, you know, they defer to these quote unquote experts. And mm. we end up hearing about how bad the Russians are or how bad the Chinese are or the quote unquote rogue states like Iran and North Korea or, you know, narco terrorists. You know, it's just there's always a bad guy that they can hype. And they never disclose, by the way, their um, financial interests. So a lot of these characters then, you know, have enormous, you know, stock options in a variety of war corporations and a variety of Wall Street firms. It's important to actually, I should have mentioned this earlier, Wall Street major financial investment firms hold the bulk, if not the lion's share of the stock in a lot of the war corporations. And so, for example, I think it was the uh, top five uh, shareholders uh, in Lockheed Martin, at least the top five, came from Wall Street, uh, BlackRock included. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, by, under that model, you have to maximize profit. You have to be involved in more wars. You have to try to take over more inherently governmental jobs. So a lot of these characters that show up uh, as pundits on uh, corporate media don't you know, disclose any of that stuff. Um, and then I should take a little side note and say that most of the major war-oriented media, the periodicals, like um, Defense News, Marine Corps Times, Air Force Times, Navy Times, mm -hmm. they are owned by Sightline Media Group, which is owned by a private equity firm, I think, based in Beverly Hills. So, again, you're not going to get, because war is so profitable, you're not going to get any uh, systemic analysis of peace in those periodicals and I then be careful i read that sometimes <laughs> I mean, so like it it does you will get uh i mean i read defense news i think it's it's decent when you're trying to understand the big picture and i i defer to it on a lot of matters but um uh, i also have to then balance that with um you know my own research and a constant reminder that hey there is no option of peace you know on these uh, in these periodicals, let me go and find uh, a piece, uh, a written piece or a media piece that covers the options of peace. Or I consult with the Eisenhower Media Network. There are many um, outstanding, um, I don't like to use the term pundits, but there are many outstanding experts um, within that group, uh, you know, especially, you know, Danny Sherson. He's uh, pretty awesome when it comes to uh, not just uh, understanding the military industrial congressional complex, but uh, the broader history of uh, the warfare state. And then just sort of to top it all off, you have substantial government interference in corporate media. There was for a long time, at least nominally a rule that said the propaganda that the US government puts out in foreign media, for example, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, that type of thing that is uh, deliberately designed to influence audiences overseas is not allowed to be 
broadcast or infiltrated into U.S.-based media. Mm. And that rule was effectively reversed, effectively deleted in what was known as the smith munt Modernization Act, which I think was passed in 2012 or crafted in 2012, passed in 2013. So now you have very, very loose rules regarding state-sponsored propaganda within uh, U.S. corporate media. So that's sort of the, the, the broad strokes of corporate media, and it's, it's very, um, it doesn't bode well for what little critical thinking ability we have as a, uh, as a country moving forward. And it, 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 going back to when we were talking about think tanks, um, mm-hmm. a think tank that we talk a lot about is PNAC. Um, <laughs> and how PNAC wrote, I mean, essentially the blueprint of the Iraq war mm-hmm. and how the New York Times and, and mainstream, you know, quote unquote, trusted outlets. And, you know, I read the New York Times. I'm, I'm actually a subscriber. And mm-hmm. um, for example, I think they're doing good work on Ethiopia right now. But there's always that question of what you can trust. And a clear example of that is when they when they had journalists like um, Judith Miller mm-hmm. um, really either flat out lie or at least be incredibly incompetent in the lies that were uh, promulgated to the U.S. from the you know most trusted outlet in the world. Um, so I kind of see this collusion between, you know, the think tanks and the corporate press and uh, what ideas to get be to put out to kind of uh, uh, gear up the or, or prime the audience um, for war. Well said. Well said. And PNAC has uh, rebranded. I don't remember what their what their new um, what their new name is. But all those characters, you know, Bill Crystal, Dave Fromm, uh, all of them are still around. There is no. It shows how insulated the MIC is because you can make a career out of advocating for military interventions that only further destabilize a country or a region, and there's no penalty whatsoever to, in fact, you get, you, you get promoted. And you get promoted in media, you get promoted in think tanks, you revolve around the military-industrial-congressional complex. And you know, we see this actually with... Um, Sort of the Biden camp, you see it with Project Lincoln, you know, the never Trumpers, you know, a lot of them. Yeah. Don't get me started on Project Lincoln. (laughs) The ultimate ultimate grift campaign. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Well said. It it was a grift campaign. It really is. And um, but they've they've succeeded in. And a lot of those um, folks that were in, for example, the George W. Bush administration went to Project Lincoln. And now some of them are popping up as possibilities for the. For the Biden camp, as um, you know, we don't have um, a real uh, multi-party system. At best, we have, as you all have uh, mentioned before, a a one-party system with two factions, and both factions agree on a lot of issues, most issues, particularly uh, war and peace, and they get us fighting about, um, you know, abortion and guns to a degree as they go straight to the bank. Exactly. I think that's really well put. They get us, uh, they get people divided on these wedge issues. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, they're, um, you know, they're, they're slaughtering people in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and just going back, if, if you're on the side of someone like Rick Wilson from the Lincoln Project or, mm-hmm. or uh, Bill Crystal or mm-hmm. and now even John Bolton, um, it, You've got to reevaluate. All right, who are these people? Uh, are they really coming to my movement with good intentions? Do they really care about the values I care about? Um, what was I going to get at here? It just slipped. It slipped my mind completely. Um, I can jump in. Um, yeah, I can jump in. You know, we're, we're we've been keeping you for over an hour here, so I've got two more main things that I want to go over. Cool. Uh, and and then you know we can wrap but the first uh, i just want to talk about some um very very contemporary geopolitics and like how that might relate you know to the war industry mm-hmm. and then i'd love for you to kind of 
give us your closing statements on like how do we get out of this mess or like what are some good suggestions sure. on like what we do so but first the, the the geopolitics part so we've been covering um some two new developments on the show uh particularly the navarno karbakh uh situation over in um Af uh, excuse me armenia and mm -hmm. uh, azerbaijan and also just very recently our last episode was uh on the escalating situation in ethiopia and I'm wondering now, now that we've all learned about how a lot of these, you know, conflicts are, are, um, you know, taken advantage of in order, or even ratcheted up for that matter, in order for the industry to make money. Uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts about how the industry might be swaying us into or away from, you know, some of these newer conflicts. That's a really good question. I shouldn't, you know, I should stay in my lane and be um, very honest that I have not followed the um, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict with any uh, intensity, uh, aside from noting that the U.S. military, excuse me, the U.S. war industry has sold goods and services to Azerbaijan. Um, I would point interested listeners to a column that actually Danny Sherson wrote for antiwar.com a while back about this. Um, and um, the, he mentions in there, uh, in particular, the contracts that uh, I think it was Lockheed Martin most prominently sold to Azerbaijan. So we are not, uh, or the U.S. government is not uh, an un, uh, unbiased participant. But I would also say that the Israelis, the, who are a very close ally to the military-industrial congressional complex, not to the American public, but to the MIC, have sold all manner of uh, war goods and services to uh, the Azeris. So, and I'm not justifying, I don't know enough about the conflict to weigh in on the, um, you know, who's right or who's wrong. Sure. Uh, I just decided to say that I have many Armenian friends, but I don't <laughs> think that, you know, that doesn't mean, you know, jack squat. But, um, yeah, in any event, the uh, the MIC is, is deeply involved in, at, at very, you know, at very best, you know, stoking, stoking the conflict. Um, and I would say that you mentioned Ethiopia. The... Ethiopia, I don't think shows, well, it certainly doesn't show up with any regularity in uh, the foreign military sales uh, from the U.S. war industry to uh, other governments or regimes around the world. But the U.S. government, particularly CIA, has been meddling in um, Ethiopia, in Sudan, in Djibouti, and in neighboring Somalia uh, for a very long time. And CIA was, I covered this in the book, was involved in um, civil war there and multiple civil wars and has been playing various sides off of one another has even been running um, guns and weaponry from the u.s war industry through kenya into somalia and uh, neighboring countries so mm -hmm. there's a lot that not only that i don't know but there's a lot that uh, you know, investigative journalists will be able to uncover as we collectively move forward and try to get out of this uh, nightmare. So it'll be business as usual then. Well, let, let, yeah. let me ask you this. So since we're speaking, talking about foreign weapons sales, mm. so wh what do you make of these deals, these F-35 deals to um, UAE and mm. potentially, uh, I think I heard Saudi Arabia now, sure. like what do you make of these deals and <laughs> are, are these Middle East peace plans um, that that Trump has bragged about? Are these just weapons deals? Like, what's your take on these? So, in recent years, the Israelis and Washington, D.C. have been coalescing a, an axis, for lack of a better word, between or among uh, Israel, UAE, Saudi Arabia. Now, the latter two are involved, actually all three are involved because of a mutual uh, dislike or hatred of Iran. And the U.S. military industrial congressional complex has Iran as one of its official enemies, or one of its boogeymen. CIA is still stinging from the 1978 revolution there when its uh, shah, its king, was kicked to the curb. 
and so the there's a, there's an alliance there. Now, it's important to highlight the Israeli role within the overall U.S. MIC because this plays a, a huge part of this whole thing. The there's a great deal of overlap between the U.S. war industry and the Israelis. So not only do the Israelis and the U.S. war industry lobby together, they hire some of the same lobbying firms, they pressure Congress for extended and expanded U.S. military intervention with throughout the greater Middle East. They both fund think tanks. They basically both know how to pressure U.S. government. They know the pressure points. So they fund think tanks together. Um, the U.S. war industry and the Israelis work on goods and services, war goods and services together, whether through joint ventures, which are when uh, two corporations basically pool resources in order to produce a good or a service. Uh, one of the most prominent ones is Raytheon from the U.S. and Elbit Systems from the Israelis. Together they make helmets for pilots. Uh, but there's all sorts of, there are all sorts of joint ventures and uh, temporary uh, alliances across corporations from D.C. to Tel Aviv. And most importantly, there is the roughly $4 billion annual gift from the U.S. taxpayer to the Israelis every year free that the Israelis are then supposed to use to purchase goods and services from the U.S. war industry. Now, it's 3.8 to 4 billion. It fluctuates depending on supplementary congressional allocations, but it's basically an indirect investment into the U.S. war industry through uh, Israel. So it goes from the taxpayer, U.S. taxpayer to the Israelis, then back into the U.S. war industry. But lately, U.S. Uh, war corporations have been signing side deals with the Israelis. So they then agree to produce uh, X percent of a given good and service within Israel using Israeli corporations. So it's a way for the Israelis to succeed in keeping more of that $4 billion annual gift from the U.S. taxpayer within uh, the overall Israeli state, however defined. So that's sort of, that's the fundamental uh, underpinning of the U.S.-Israeli uh, relationship vis-a-vis -vis the overall military industrial congressional complex. And then you have two other horrible regimes in the Middle East, the UAE, which is in a despotic regime. There is no uh, freedom of speech. There is no uh, freedom of expression. And the Saudis, which are basically the worst when it comes to uh, anti-democratic uh, tendencies. It's run by a king, but functionally right now, the crown prince, uh, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, and he um, is not only petulant, but very uh, uncalculating and very arrogant in many ways. So, long story short, the three worst regimes in the region are allied uh, to confront Iran, and all three purchase goods and services from the U.S. war industry, the Saudis using, using the petrodollar, and the UAE using uh, its extensive uh, you know, financial resources, including its you know, sovereign wealth fund. And it doesn't bode well for peace at all because uh, nobody within those three regimes are going to step up and say no for a variety of you know financial and professional incentives. Who do you think will be the first uh, ruler that Joe Biden's going to meet with? Will it be Will it be uh, King Salman if he's still alive? That's a great question. That's a really great question. Just like just like Trump did, he flew right to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah put his hands was... on that globe. <laughs> Remember so that? <laughs> I bet it would be Netanyahu. <laughs> Yeah, probably. Um, you know, there's there's a certain amount of deference that whenever a uh, U.S. ruler of, you know, the White House caliber or a prominent senator goes to the region, they have to, you know, make a stop in Tel Aviv and say, you know, pay their due diligence to the Israelis and spout the usual, uh, you know, there's no stronger ally. You know, we have shared investments. Israel's the only democracy in the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know who's, uh, who Biden will go to first, but uh, at some point, all three of those uh, regimes will be on the list. I have kind of a crackpot theory that the Biden team wants to get rid of, of uh, MBS. Like, they, they kind of see him as a liability. Mm. Okay. Um, and they preferred, the, the Democrats, um, like liberal hawks, pres uh, preferred um, Mohammed Benayef, the guy mm -hmm. who was crown prince prior. 
Um, yeah. And I think, I think just from my perception, I, I see a lot of, um, I feel like a lot of people from like the entrenched security state kind of saw MBS as more of a Trump ally. Mm. So I feel like they won't be as supportive for of them. That's why they'll kind of, uh, you know, they'll they'll give lip service to the war in Yemen and things like that, mm. like those atrocities. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past them. And, you know, seeing the the team that Biden is putting together, uh, there is uh, Avril Haines, who um, everyone uh, within the you know liberal centrist uh, clique adores because, you know, she is a female warmonger you know and when they play these you know identity politics it, it's absolutely nauseating you know as long as you are you know check the uh, identity politics weaponized identity politics boxes then you're okay it doesn't matter the harm it doesn't matter if you were part of cia which has caused you know countless civilian deaths of women around the globe uh, avril haynes is part of she was a deputy director um uh, for a very long time under obama she was one of the architects of obama's uh, drone war. She was one of the legal architects. Now, before uh, DOD or CIA or the U.S. government in general engages in any nefarious activity overseas, the first thing it does is it gets its legal cards in order. Now, it doesn't have to be legal by international standards or by objective, hey, this is horrible and inhumane and cruel standards. It just has to be legal according to D.C.'s books because then they can say, hey, it's legal, we're good. And you see that... Um, you see that with a ton of stuff. You saw that with, for example, the raid on Osama bin Laden. The, it was carried out by the U.S. military. But the U.S. military, according to the Pakistani president, was not allowed in Pakistan at the time. So what did they do? They took the U.S. Special Operations Forces that were carrying out the raid, and they did, quote-unquote, sheep dip them, which basically means they took them from Title X, under which the U.S. military operates, to Title 50, under which the CIA operates, and they basically put them under Title 50 for the duration of the mission. And, you know, it's just, it's literally just uh, magic. They're turning, they're turning... Um, you are now CIA. <laughs> exactly. It, it's absolutely horrible. And so there are, no, there are no restrictions. As long as you can justify anything legally, then you are good to go. And that's, uh, you see a lot of these uh, legal experts uh, coming in on the Biden uh, team, and it does not bode well for peace at all because they are master magicians. Um, and, I, you know, I don't uh, know enough about the inner workings of the Saudi kingdom to uh, speculate on MBS versus Bin Nayef. Um, though I will say that the uh, permanent unelected bureaucracy such as CIA was very cozy with Bin Nayef and the moves that uh, MBS has been making lately have unnerved a few of them. So I wouldn't, you know, what you said uh, could very well absolutely be true. And that's total, that's total speculation for any, everyone listening right now. That is, yeah. that is not based <laughs> off any, like, inc- deep, deep insight to the Saudi <laughs> monarchy or the royal family. But I know I can see, I could just, I don't know, but when you're doing this. Henry from Bro feeling. History said that they're going to get rid of MBS. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can hear it now. Um, yeah. Well, if I'm I, proven uh, right. <laughs> I, I think this has been incredibly fascinating, but also incredibly depressing, uh, Christian. Yeah. Um, so maybe we can carry out the last couple of minutes of, of the episode here with just uh, talking about the part of your book that I admittedly have not gotten to, mm. <laughs> which is how do we get out of this? Like what what do we like what recourse do we as concerned citizens have to right the ship, so to speak? You know, what are some plausible things that we can do or that our government can do uh, to make it so that this situation doesn't suck so much? Well, that's uh, that is a great question. And I am oddly optimistic. So we either right the ship or we all go down in flames. It's not just the uh, brain drain. It's not just the resource drain that endless war uh, poses not just the financial drain. I mean, imagine if we had freed up the around 60% of discretionary funds every year that go to the Pentagon and the overall warfare state. Imagine if you have that freed up. Imagine what you could invest in when it comes to, you know, education, infrastructure, health and human services. You can uh, end child poverty. I think in your book you wrote like something like 70 billion or something mm-hmm. like that. 
is all we would need. Exactly. There are there are many metrics um, that are immensely frustrating when you read. You know, yeah, something like seventy billion. I think you could either could end uh, child poverty or bring everyone in the U.S. up at least to the poverty line or above the poverty line. Yeah, that's that's that was the one. Yeah, you got it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, imagine imagine what you do. Um, military research, military uh, investments. They not only produce fewer jobs than education, infrastructure, clean energy, but imagine the possibilities. If we took, say, take the $700 billion annual budget and you put it in education or labor or commerce or um, Or healthcare. my pocket. <laughs> yeah. well, no, you make a great point because imagine yeah. if we had, you know, uh, universal basic income. I mean, or imagine during Just a pandemic, less taxes. actually had a you know regular monthly stipend you know there's mm-hmm. there's plenty of money for a record war budget during right. a pandemic but there's not money for what every other advanced industrial nation did which is give monthly stipends to its citizenry i mean that's that's absolute nonsense that's well, absolutely they gave us twelve hundred dollars and told us to go fuck ourselves so <laughs> they absolutely did they absolutely did and that right there should tell you the not only about the insulated nature of the military industrial congressional complex but about the overall state of the u.s ruling class they are incapable of reforming. They are absolutely incapable of reforming. Neither the blue team nor the red team gives a flying F about the American public. And that is an absolute fact based on the legislation that they pass. There is always more money for war. There is always more money for optional uh, you know, military investments. There is never money for health care. The American public, universal health care is phenomenally popular with the American public. It's upward, I think it's upward of 80% across party lines. Uh, U.S. public is, is in favor of that. No matter how you phrase the question, no matter what you know corporate media channel you turn it, tune into, universal health care is immensely popular, and the U.S. federal government does not reflect the will of the people. And it goes back to the old uh, Princeton study in 2013 that says that we are functionally an oligarchy. We're not a democracy because our will, the American public's will, does not uh, affect the decisions that Capitol Hill makes. So then, the, getting back to your question, what do we do? We, there are two things that we could immediately do to right the ship and to end the wars and to, you know, bring the troops home, take care of them and to, you know, eventually give um, some sort of restitution to all of those that we have harmed overseas. The first thing we could do is to nationalize the major war corporations. However, Hmm. if we, we can't do that. Now, why can't we do that? Because those who would be doing the nationalizing uh, don't listen to the American public. So if the American public, even if we had 80 percent, 90 percent of the American public who wanted to nationalize the, you know, the war industry and wanted to then use that immense, uh, those immense resources in those uh, facilities to produce, say, PPE or anything that goes toward human need instead of war and war profiteering. That would be fantastic, but we we can't do that because Capitol Hill is not responsive to the American public's needs. So because we live in an oligarchy, we are forced to eventually take it into our own hands. So that is why the other option is basically all we have left. And the other option is to democratize the workplace. And that means as it stands right now in the war industry facilities across the U.S., you have decisions made not by those in the local facilities. The decisions are made at headquarters. Typically, the headquarters are located in Northern Virginia or Southern Maryland so that they can better influence policy in Washington, Mm D.C. So under the current corporate structure, you have a handful of suits hundreds of miles away making the decisions about what you produce, how you produce it, and who you sell it to, and whether you pollute or not. Those decisions are not made at the local level. So if you want democracy in the workplace, what you do as the U.S. working class is take control of the workplace. And it is going to require a class conscious working class, a working class that understands the nature of the U.S. ruling class, that regardless of party allegiance, the U.S. ruling class does not care about the American public. And once you take control of the facility, You determine what you make, how you make it, and you are the best person suited. You, the workers who work at those facilities, know the tools, know the inputs, know the supply chains, know what you have, and know what you can then make. 
So one of the things I'm investigating now is based on all the notes that I've taken over the past, what, seven years of looking at these contracts is to say, all right, you have facility X in you know, Lima, Ohio. What can you do at that facility? What do you currently produce within the war industry and how can you then use that output? What can you put out there that is not uh, involved in war profiteering and that is not a what ultimately would become a weapon of war? So some facilities have an easier time than others. For example, Newport News, Virginia has a lot of shipyards. Okay, you can, in order to make a ship, you can make any type of ship. It doesn't have to have, you know, weaponry on it. That's basically right. the only switch you need to make in there. So th the, the shipbuilding has a pretty, has a pretty clean sweep and a que uh, clean switch. And as David Swanson pointed out recently, there was, during the initial COVID pandemic, there were workers at one of the General Dynamics facilities, I believe it was in Bath, Maine, who demanded that the facility start producing PPE, and the facility did. So there's precedent there. It, it can happen as long as the workers are united, as long as the workers do not allow themselves to be divided by identity politics and by racial divisions and by you know, the, the wedge issues, like you said. Um, to give another example, if there's a um, vehicle manufacturer in Sterling Heights, Michigan, the vehicle manufacturer can continue to put out those vehicles. It just doesn't have to be armed and they just don't have to sell it to, you know, despotic regimes overseas or to, you know, the U.S. government. And once the once the momentum is underway, the public can uh, really rally around this. It takes clear communication. It, it takes uh, patience. But we can absolutely, absolutely pull that off, you know, and even even really um, uh, esoteric portions of the U.S. war industry, such as nuclear weapons, that can still be transferred to other uh, civilian uh, uses. You still have an immense amount of aerospace technology for any given uh, intercontinental ballistic missile. You still have the rocketry that can be used to put civilian peaceful satellites into space. You have, you have an incredible body of scientists and engineers and physicists mathematicians, et cetera, et cetera, that you can then free, you can liberate them, and you can have them become part of civilian, peaceful, for human, for the natural world uh, industries. That's what's going to, that's the only way I see forward uh, out of this, is a united working class, united across racial lines, that does not allow the, uh, the two political factions to, to divide. And we must, I'll just I'll close with this, we must remember that the U.S. working class is the many and the U.S. ruling class is the few. I mean, there's, there's only a handful of them. And um, once, once we become united, we can, we can literally do anything we want. Christian Sorensen, that was uh, phenomenal. Um, and I look forward to a day when we can actually start moving on some of those, on some of those things. Uh, before we cut here, I'd love to give you an opportunity to plug any and everything that you got. <laughs> well, first of all, gentlemen, I want to say thank you. This has been a, a real treat. I appreciate your time and, uh, you know, consider me a, a, a new fan of uh, bro history. I'll be tuning in thank you. whenever you all uh, put, out a new, uh, put out a new episode. This was really wonderful. Just want to give a shout out to Clarity Press, which, ha which published my book, Understanding the War Industry. You can get it at Clarity Press. Um, and please avoid Amazon, but if you, if you have to, you can get it through Amazon, but you can get it, you can order it through your local bookstore, your mom and pop shop uh, if you want. I also plug the Eisenhower Media Network under the uh, leadership of Danny Sherson. It is getting off the ground as we speak, and it's basically an independent uh, group of like-minded military and intelligence uh, veterans who are looking to uh, promote a uh, more peaceful discourse and to let the U.S. public know that not every veteran is pro-war and every veteran, we come from a variety of, of backgrounds and uh, many of us are, are pro-peace. So I'll plug Clarity Press. They do an excellent job. You can check out their other books and uh, the Eisenhower Media Network. And um, just close by saying I'm getting my website uh, revamped and it will soon be available at warindustrymuster.com over the next uh, couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, I'm on the old Twitter machine at CP underscore S-O-R-E-N-S-E-N. -E -E and that's about that. All right. Well, Christian, thanks again for joining us. Uh, this has been awesome. Um, 
Really appreciate your time today. And everyone, make sure that you rate and review the podcast if you're listening right now. If you're on Apple Podcast, uh, do us a favor, rate and review the podcast if you enjoyed this. If you listen to the entire podcast, you definitely enjoyed it. So rate and review it. And then also, um, if you want to support us further, we have a Patreon. Um, Patreon, uh, you get access to our Slack account. In the Slack account, you get a bunch of cool, um, basically, it's a cool place to let loose or to blow off steam or maybe debate or share whatever. But it's really fun. We're having a lot of fun in there. So um, support us on Patreon, rate and review the podcast. And uh, I guess I will, uh, Danny, any last words? Nope. Peace, everybody. All right. Peace, guys.